Again, a uh, very good morning and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We'll begin our power sector decarbonization section one uh, panel session uh, now. Uh, thank you for uh, staying with us for, for this workshop. Uh, it, it's a very important workshop by Asia Green Future Project. Just to cut it short, uh, Asian ASEAN Green Future or AGF is a multi-year project involving the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, uh, Climate Work Centre, and nine countries' teams that come from leading universities and think tank across Southeast Asia, namely Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand. So it's indeed a great honour to have uh, four very important experts to shed lights on how power sector can be decarbonized uh, according to their own unique experience. So let me first introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, Mrs. Trang Nguyen. She is the Southeast Asia Lead at Climate Work Centre, an independent and non-profit think tank under Monash University. Her team works with stakeholders in Australia and Southeast Asia to scale up climate ambitions across areas including decarbonisation pathways, climate finance, and just energy transition. Before joining Climate Works, Chuang worked in both public and private sectors, including for Victoria State Government, the UK's Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, the German Agency for International Cooperation, GIZ, uh, ANZ Bank, and KPMG. She has a master's degree in banking and finance from the University of Nottingham in the UK. So without further ado, let us put our hands together to welcome uh, Ms. Trung. The floor is yours. Thank you for your kind introduction. And before starting, I really want to, um, um, on behalf of Climate World Central, I would like to send our gratitude to um, Sunway University and also you and SDSSN for your um, hosting us today and a very, very insightful and extremely well-organized workshop. Um, quickly about myself, my name is um, Chang Nguyen. As some of you, my, I'm the Southeast Asia Lead for Climate Work Center. As some of you might recognize from my name, I'm a Vietnamese by background. I spent most of my career actually in Southeast Asia, um, including six years working for the UK government in Vietnam as the head of uh, sustainable development uh, before moving to uh, Melbourne last year. Uh, and now I work for Climate Work Center. For those who, who of you who haven't known about Climate Works yet, very quickly about ourselves. We are an independent uh, centre within Monash University. We are founded to bridge the gap between research and climate actions, um, which is pretty much explained my presentation's uh, title today, um, the regional decarbonisation cooperation in South Asia, bridging the gap between um, research and climate actions. Our office, um, our organization is headquartered in Australia under Monash University in Melbourne. We also have another office in Jakarta uh, in, um, Monash University, uh, under Monash University Indonesia. Um, and we plan this year to uh, expand our work in some other countries in South Asia, including Vietnam and hopefully Philippines next year. My presentation today hopefully um, is to set the scene for why we do what we do um, within ASEAN Green Future and what we aim to achieve. I will start by providing um, a big picture overview of where we are with the decarbonization journey at national and regional level based on our reviewing of 45 decarbonization pathway um, and modeling exercises in the region. It will then be followed by our um, analysis on what are the drivers and barriers um, that could hinder a regional collaboration. And in the final part, I will um, highlight some of the proposed um, recommendations. So let me start with um, an overview of where we are with the low carbon transition 
Um, and this is a table summarized by Climate Work Central, which um, reflecting and summarizing um, where are different ASEAN member states uh, based on three key um, criteria uh, reflected in the national NDC targets, long-term climate ambitions, um, and renewable energy targets. There are three key things I want to highlight in this slide. Um, first of all, in terms of um, net zero target, most Southeast Asia countries now have a net zero target, um, except for Myanmar and the Philippines. The second thing, which is uh, very interesting, is that there are significant gaps between the conditional and unconditional targets of NDCs, um, the national determined contributions in uh, a couple of Southeast Asia countries. I can give some example. For example, Philippines um, have an unconditional net zero target of 2.7, whereas their conditional target is 72%. So there is a significant gap between what the country commit themselves and what the country commit when it comes to um, condition having international collaboration and having support on technology and financing and some other several examples that I can highlight. For example, Vietnam also have a very big gap between unconditional and conditional targets. Um, the, th the third thing I want to highlight is that all Southeast Asia countries now all have a net zero target, um, a renewable energy target. And within ASEAN, um, and, and it has been highlighted in several presentations before, uh, ASEAN now also have a regional share target. Um, but there are various analyses highlight that these targets can be more ambitious, not because to meet the net zero commitment, but also because there are significant potential for Southeast Asia countries to increase this uh, renewable energy uptake. So in this slide, um, we, this is, um, you can see the graph on the left hand side. We, analyze the transactory, um, emission transactories of Southeast Asia in comparison to some other countries, for example, Japan, Korea, Australia, and the EU. Um, and this is compiled by Climate Works based on Climate Watch data. And there are two things I would like to highlight about this graph. The first thing is that when it comes to emission trajectory, Southeast Asia, um, and excluding land use, ASEAN is still on the trajectories of increasing emission. Why other countries in the regions uh, or neighboring countries or other countries comparing um, start to signal a downward trend? And this is uh, confirmed by the, um, the recent um, ASEAN Energy Outlook by the ASEAN Central for Energy, highlighting that without new policy, ASEAN's greenhouse gas emission, excluding land use and international transportation, um, are expected to increase by 3.7 fold from now until 2050. The second thing which I find um, quite interesting when we compare the data with the EU and including um, the land use emission data, um, Without land use, ASEAN emission is still less than the EU, but when it comes to include land use emission, um, Southeast Asia emission already surpassed the EU's figure. Um, and that's one that basically reflects that most of modeling and scenario at the moment tend to focus a lot on energy system decarbonization, which is absolutely the most important thing to do. But what we want to highlight is that without land use, the full picture of emission in South Asia will not be complete. Um, this slide, we um, analyzing um, study 45 modeling exercise undertaken by government, multilateral organization, and NGOs um, on decarbonization pathway. Um, you can see on the graph, um, 2022 is actually the year where a lot of new pathway modeling and exercise have been developed. And it's uh, understandably because it was after COP26 and uh, where after several South Asia countries start to commit a new uh, climate target and therefore need to revise their NDC and long-term strategies. Um, the majorities of study identify 
70% of them focus on energy sector, including NU sectors. Um, and the whole of economy pathway have been undertaken um, at domestic level to inform the long-term strategies that uh, Professor Sachs has mentioned in his, his speech. Um, we identified that five countries already got that exercise um, done at government level, and then um, some other countries have non-government entity um, also conduct those ex exercises for them. At regional level, most of the existing modeling exercise are developed on um, for energy sector, uh, which um, and also to note that several pathways at the moment um, highlight the lack of uh, political win for ASEAN power grid. For example, the uh, the IEA the their modeling exercise assuming that capacity of grid connection among South Asia countries is constrained based on the planned capacity and consultation uh, with ASEAN member states. Um, we also find that there are very few references from ASEAN pathway to uh, national pathway to the ASEAN's chair targets, um, which represents a lack of linkages between um, and also lack of legally binding instruments for ASEAN member states to achieve the ASEAN net zero share targets. Um, also, another thing we also identify is that um, there is significant, uh, a lot of uh, Southeast Asia countries highlight the importance of adaptation and uh, climate resilience as well in parallel to decarbonization, which uh, reflects uh, vulnerabilities of different ASEAN member states. When it comes to technology, um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, there are significant, sorry, is that, oh, five minutes, sorry. Um, there are significant gaps between conditional and unconditional targets, which means reflect the significant financing and technology gaps um, of different South ASEAN member states. I think uh, because there are five minutes left, so I just want to quickly run through what are the key drivers for regional integrations. Um, so why ASEAN and ASEAN member states um, need to work together and come together? We highlight in three key pillars on governance, on financing, and on trade. Um, on governance, um, there, as one of the fastest growing regions globally, uh, ASEAN together can provide a strengthened political voice in climate diplomacy. Um, and as various speakers have mentioned, the importance of ASEAN power grid um, to the country national, uh, to achieve the national targets. Um, in terms of financing, there are significant opportunities for financing mobilization at scale when it comes to ASEAN coming together. Um, and also there is alignment on, significant need for alignment on uh, financing policy, financing integration, on taxonomy, uh, disclosure standards that will be able to pull together uh, financing to the region at scale. Um, and on trade, given the current um, most legally binding instrument that uh, South Asia and ASEAN can have at the moment is actually the ASEAN Economic Community, which has certain success and progress in um, on um, the removing tariffs. Um, there is certain um, certain opportunities for ASEAN countries coming together and. Um, incentivize the trade on renewable through removing trade barriers. Um, and there are different barriers to achieve um, regional um, integration. I'm conscious of time, I just want to highlight one thing, is that actually the founding principle of ASEAN doesn't allow um, the countries to actually to enforce and to incentivize ASEAN member states to work together. There is lack of fiscal integration, lack of monetary policy and capital market linkages in order to uh, for ASEAN and South Asia countries to actually um, make any difference uh, without illegally binding instruments. Um, 
I'm, I'm going to quickly run through the recommendations. So, based on the drivers and the barriers that I have highlighted, it is, there is a strong case for ASEAN countries to increase cross-border collaboration for ASEAN power grid connectivity, for investment, green investment policy, and to attract investment at scale. Um, and for these shared targets and alignment of decarbonization pathway, it's very important in this process. Um, the second thing is that um, cooperation in the region is not just about at ASEAN level. There are significant opportunities to, uh, for sub-regional collaboration as well, and that's already ongoing happen within South Asia, and there is opportunity for embed that through some of the legally binding cooperation mechanism. Um, and it's, as I highlighted before, it's very important to have a full picture of a whole economy modeling pathway, including things like land use, which will better inform policymakers uh, of the full picture of regional emission sources. Um, this is our case study of Climate Work Central Decar Future work in Australia, where um, where I really just want to illustrate how we use the decarbonization pathway to uh, incentivize to work and with government, with industry, and um, to inform government about uh, the pathway, the benchmark, um, the settings, the investment, the procurement, and how government and uh, business can work together. I don't have time to go into detail for this today, but we are very happy to discuss with you later on during this session or um, during the day. I just want to end it, my presentation with um, a very positive note. Um, this is a graph uh, from the latest issue of the IMF Economic Outlook. Um, and according to this graph, um, ASEAN altogether is expected to account for a larger share of global growth this year than the Middle East, the Europe, or the Africa. This means two things to me. Um, first of all, higher growth means that much, uh, much more uh, requirement needed for decarbonization. But the second thing is basically means that altogether, South Asia has the opportunities to become a force for good, a part of global clean supply chain, and attract green investment at scale. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Very happy to discuss in detail later. Thank you, thank you Ms. Rang, for uh, limited, limited time given, but a um, um, lot of insights that have shared with us. Uh, next, we'll have Professor uh, Prophet uh, Kyofi Lawung. Uh, he's the Associate Professor and Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Business Management from the National University of Laos. Uh, he received his PhD in Economics from Kobe University in 2003 and has been carrying out research on issues including SMEs, macroeconomic management, economic integration, energy, natural resources, and poverty, contributing to such publications as the International Review of Economics and Finance, Research in International Business and Finance, Economic Modeling, and others. Today, he is going to share with us on how to decarbonize the power sector in Lao PDR. So, Professor, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, for introduction. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Sunbay University to inviting me to a really uh, important uh, workshop today. Um, so please show me the slides. Okay. Um, this is uh, my presentation. This is part of the ASEAN Green Future Project that uh, we are um, working on. And this is the really preliminary study for the, this one. And um, as you know that um, the Laos is a very small landlocked country in ASEAN. And uh, we are facing a number of uh, economic and environmental challenges. We are LDC, and the escape of the LDC is the main goal. Surely we want to commit uh, with the, uh, reducing the natural admission by uh, 2015. That is, is the, even though the, we are small, but we the, allow government try to 
commit and try our best to reduce the CO2 emission. Today I'm going to talk about, um, about uh, how we can reduce the energy sector. In fact, um, we don't have much uh, challenge in the energy sector because most of electricity in Laos we produce by hydropower dam. And in addition, we also the export electricity to Thailand and Cambodia. And we plan to export to uh, in Singapore too right now and going to export to Vietnam uh, very soon. So um, that that is the... Uh, the beef information, but as you know, the Lao have about 80% of our land areas is mountainous area and very suitable for producing electricity by hydropower dam. In Korean situation, we only use our potential only uh, 30% of our potential of hydropower. That that is is very huge important that. Uh, that we can um, build the regional grid that can transfer our electricity to Singapore and Malaysia in the near future. And so that, um, however, the, the reducing the CO2 emission is, is one of the, the main challenge for, for the Lao, because if you see the in the transport station uh, sector, it is very high share. Uh, it's account about uh, uh, seventy percent of the 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 uh, kin, kin gas emission that we have. So um, that uh, in the field, if you see by field, you can see uh, uh, we by. Uh, uh, diesel fuel is, is uh, producing a lot of, of CO2 emission. Uh, in here, uh, when we talking about uh, greenhouse gas emission, we need to be considering only the transportation sector is, is very important key. But our, our friends from um, Monash mentioned that without uh, considering the agriculture, forestry, and land use change, is we cannot. Uh, capture on uh, the the situation of the greenhouse gas emission in 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 my Laos. So um, our study that we using the leap modeling that we have the training by uh, ASEAN Green uh, Future Project that it is our the first time that we use the really powerful tool that to try to estimate and simulation energy uh, demand and supply of energy and 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 in addition also to try to project the the energy demand and emission in the future that is is very uh, important tool the more detail i think is is our uh, friends from the stockholm environmental institute we talk later more detail because they are the expert i am just the user of the model and yes um, when you look and hear the demand of energy by sector is, is very significantly increasing if you see in the, the full charge in the in industrial sector and transportation. And um, by uh, but we we see the sort of because of the, we make some assumption in the model electric generation source is mostly uh, energy, uh, electricity formed by our hydropower thing. That installing capacity, as I mentioned before, we, we in this model we just put not much uh, potential, but actually we uh, have more potential in the installing capacity in the uh, producing electricity in the case of Laos. Uh, now we because of the leaf, we can do some simulation. That is is very important part. As Professor Jaffisak already mentioned, that we need the plan, long term planning, and uh, that that is is very important thing. So we try to surely the 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 plan and simulation need to make the assumption. In addition, we do some uh, two. Uh, 
simulation scenario. One is existing policy that the government now are doing right now, current situation now, extension in the future. Uh, second scenario is high ambitious. Now it is high ambitious, but not really try to reduce um, so, uh, greenhouse gas to the zero. Uh, net zero emission. That that is is by making the assumption. You can see that in in case of Lao, we do resident is uh, we want to improve efficiency of the cooking and um, and uh, improvement the Lulo and Ubon area to access to electricity so they can use the electricity to uh, cooking. Uh, and uh, for the transportation, we concentrate more on uh, using the EV, uh, electric vehicle car, uh, in the individually and uh, in the tang and public transportation. Right now, it seems that EV in Lao number of EV increasing quite significantly because the Lao government give the tax incentive to. Um, uh, people who want to buy the EV, and uh, in addition, uh, because thanks to the uh, China, uh, because the EV from China import from the China is quite uh, um, not so expensive, like uh, if compared with uh, uh, another country. So that that is is our simulation what we we did, and uh, we we. Um, we make the assumption uh, on this and try to make the projection in the future. We can see that um, uh, energy uh, demand is, is a little bit reduced if compared with uh, existing policy because we try to improve uh, energy efficiency and, uh, and, and so on. So that, that is reducing. But however, we, if we see the electric city demand, um, you can see it is increasing uh, with the, um, with compared with the, the uh, existing policy gap and come to high investors policy. Uh, mostly we can see that energy, uh, electric city demand by increasing because of the transportation and also the uh, also and uh, in that uh, industry, that's so that's why. Now we can move to the emission. That is this very important part that we need to considering uh, because it's the goal of our project, how we can to achieve the natural emission. So we can find out that the, the, the existing policy and uh, high emphasis aim of the what we try to do is quite reducing quite significantly uh, because of we try to promote one is try to improve the use of the EV. Uh, second thing is is more efficient on the especially the in even though the Lao sell electricity, but um, in Lulu area we still don't have uh, some remote area cannot access to electricity, they uh, can all use the biomass for cooking. So if we can improve in that, uh, it is mean that um, the CO2 emission is, is going to be declined, as you, you can see here, uh, that, that is the comparison between existing policy and high ambitious aim uh, policy that, that we, we have that it is going to be reducing about the 50% of uh, zero emission. But surely we cannot achieve the net zero emission in 2050. But if we have the, our friends from the Mona saying, if we have the conditional, conditional is this many condition, is this like a finance, technology, and capacity that we need, I'm sure that we, we can achieve. But it, in addition, we need to have considering about the agriculture, forestry, land use span. Because uh, of Laos, we have about 50% uh, of land area is, uh, is, is forestry uh, 
cover uh, this this t i l l a g e uh, of the potential of the in term of the carbon sink that is is very important that he absorb the CO2 in the future that that is is very we have the big potential for that. So I, I would like to come to the, the my conclusion and some policy recommendation. Even though Lao uh, really small, but we the Lao government we highly committed to reduce the the CO2 uh, emission, um, and in order to reduce the poverty, I uh, escape from the LDC. And but however, um, it is to achieve the goal. Uh, ambitious policy scenario. We need to improve the um, efficiency uh, of the electricity uh, use in the cooking or um, and uh, in uh, in residential area and industry and service sector. In addition, um, as you see, that most of The emission is from the transportation. The EV promotion, the EV should be uh, moved on, and more um, government need to provide more incentive for that. And that that even though the right now um, the public transportation too, that we need to installing the EV car. That is is very important. The last one is is continuing to. Uh, Um, develop the electricity that produced by hydropower dam. That is very important. That uh, we can uh, move forward for that because uh, because the, of the COVID and economic slowdown, the number of project is is uh, getting slow, and uh, so that is is very important for for Lao, and that 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 we need to be consider. Um, the lastly, I think this is one of the most important. But solar and um, hydro power dam is can generate much energy during the rainy season when we have rain. But during dry season, we need more solar energy system that the Lao government also in considering uh, to to promote more solar energy. That that on this is my presentation. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor r o f e r t As he mentioned, that transportation is the key uh, to decarbonize uh, Lao uh, power sector, uh, which is pretty interesting because Lao is endowed with uh, abundance of renewable energy, which is mainly consisted of hydropower. So next, uh, we will then move the focus from Lao back to Malaysia. And we have uh, Professor Leong Yuan Yong, the Director of Sustainability Studies in SDS and Asia, and Professor at Sunway University. Uh, she also co-leads the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network ASEAN Green Future Project. So, for your information, this project uh, has uh, undertaken net zero pathway analysis to inform policy recommendations and to support strategic foresight. Of ASEAN policymakers in shaping a sustainable future, according to UN SDGs. Professor Leong, the floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This work is presented on behalf of Andrew Fan, Lo w i s e n Justin Liu, Li c h e n c h o n g Vijaya s i l e n Jeremy Lim and Wu Wing Tai. Malaysia has a population of 33 million. Annual population growth rate is 0.2 percent. GDP was 406 billion US dollars. Economic growth rate was 8.7 percent, and inflation was 2.8 percent last year. In 2019, Malaysia's total greenhouse gas emissions. With 330 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, today we shall paint a picture about Malaysia's power transition for you from three angles: power generation, demand, and flexible electricity system. In 2019. 
Greenhouse gas emissions from the power sector were 169 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. That was 51% of the total greenhouse gas emissions of Malaysia. They come from burning coal and gas for electricity. Gas contributes to 28% of power emissions, and it provides 38% of total electricity generation. Coal accounts for 71% of power emissions, but only 46% of generation. Carbon intensity of electricity generation increased by 23% between 2001 and 2019. In 2001, coal generated 14% of Malaysian electricity. Following the dash for coal due to cheaper coal prices compared to natural gas, that share increased to 46% in 2019, and the share of natural gas generated electricity fell from 72% to 38%. Hydropower accounted for 14% of electricity generation in 2019, up from 9% in 2001. Greenhouse gas emissions in the energy sector increased 115% from 2001 to 2019. Power generation and transport were the two highest emitters, followed by industry. Reducing emissions from electricity generation whilst meeting new demands from the electrification of industry, transport, residential and commercial will require a portfolio of generation technologies, energy efficiency measures, flexible demand and storage. The existing policy scenario is built using published government projections, targets and reports. The more ambitious policy are, Im are imaginative scenarios that reduce emissions more aggressively. These two scenarios are modelled using the Low Emissions Analysis Platform, LEAP, developed by Charlie Heaps at the Stockholm Environment Institute. We investigate the scenario's potential emission reductions and sufficiency for meeting national targets. Assumptions of the scenarios are set out in our report. The existing policy and more ambitious policy scenarios are analysed from five angles. Demand and energy efficiency, variable new renewables, dispatchable low carbon generation, firm power high carbon generation and system flexibility. First, existing policy. These demand sectors have incorporated efficiency measures that limit the increase in electricity demand. Residential, energy efficiency labels were introduced in 2006 by the Energy Commission and issued to electrical appliances manufacturers that comply with the standards and requirements of energy performance test. In 2011 and 2021, the Malaysian government ran the sustainability achieved via energy efficiency program SAFE that provided cash rebates for the purchase of energy efficient refrigerators, air conditioners and chillers. Industry. Factors that contribute to the, to the electricity demand increase in industry include industrial expansion, population growth, urbanization and infrastructure development, technological advancements, climate control, and cooling needs. Energy efficiency improvement measures in number one, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. For example, efficient chiller, variable speed drive, and thermal energy storage. Number two, in equipment, for example, compressor, high efficiency motor. And number three, in processes, for example, heat recovery, cogeneration, can impact electricity demand substantially. Budget 2001 waived the import duty and sales tax on energy efficient equipment and accelerated capital allowances or pioneer status for investment in energy efficient technologies and projects. Other key initiatives include energy performance contracting, 
and the 24 degrees Celsius policy in government, commercial or industrial buildings. Services. The electricity demand of the service sector is projected to increase substantially towards 2050 due to economic growth, technological advancements, changing work environments, increasing energy intensive services and electrification of transport. The small increase in electricity demand from transport that you see on screen is due to our model not yet reflecting the effects of government actions announced last year to encourage electric vehicles. For example, targets in public charging stations and tax incentives for EVs. Malaysia targets 31% of renewable energy in installed power generation capacity in 2025 and 40% in 2035. The renewable energy capacity mix in, Malaysia, in, in the Malaysia Renewable Energy Roadmap is shown in the table. The map shows the renewable energy potential across Malaysia. Solar PV's potential far exceeds other REs. This slide shows the projected capacity and generation by technology in 2030 and 2050. Malaysia should harness more of its big solar resources. The country has the potential to deploy 269 gigawatts of solar power capacity, but the projected installed capacity in 2050 is 6.5 gigawatts. Malaysia should develop its wind power, offshore wind power potential in Trungganu and northern Sabah. Wind energy is not included in the Renewable Energy Act 2011 as a renewable resource because the Sustainable Energy Development Authority, SEDA, did not commission a wind power study for Malaysia during the inception of the Act, thus was unable to estimate the levelized cost of energy and establish the fit-in tariff for wind energy. Wind power is the lowest in emission and one of the cheapest forms of generation. SEDA plans to conduct a feasibility study and economics assessment on the implementation of onshore and offshore wind post-2025. Commissioning this study sooner will be benefit wind power development in Malaysia. Levelized costs of electricity of renewables have fallen significantly over the past decade. Variable renewables will need to be accompanied by changes to the electric electricity system to accommodate the intermittency. Hydropower is projected to contribute 30% of total power generation in 2050. Malaysia's biomass gener power generation is negligible and should be increased because of the forestry and agriculture industries here. Biomass is projected to be more expensive than renewables, but could bring value to a system dominated by variable generation. Malaysia's biogas power generation is also negligible. Malaysia will still have substantial coal power generation in 2050, 24% of total power generation is projected to come from coal in 2050. That will generate 63 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is 51% of Malaysia's total generation emissions. In the existing policy scenario, Malaysia's RE capacity will not reach 70% of all power generation capacity in 2050. We look forward to the two new roadmaps on energy transition and the hydrogen economy for Malaysia, which will be introduced by our government later this year. More ambitious policy, residential. We implemented more aggressive targets by increasing the penetration rate of energy efficient household devices to 100% by 2060. For industry, we increased fuel share for electricity from 34% in 2018 to 46% in 2050, which is the degree of electrification projected by IEA for the industry sector in a net zero 2050 roadmap for the, for the global energy sector. The projected electricity demand for these two sectors have decreased and increased accordingly. 
After this, we proceeded to not add new fossil fuel generation capacities from 2030 onwards, but let LEAP add new renewable energy capacity to the system as needed to meet the total and peak electricity demands. By doing this, RE generation share in 2050 is projected to increase from 37% in the existing policy scenario to 83% in 2050 in the more ambitious policy scenario. RE generation capacity is projected to reach 62% of total generation capacity in 2050. This approaches the 70% RE capacity in 2050 target that was recently announced. Power generation GHG emissions of the more ambitious policy scenario is 70% lower in 2050 compared to the existing policy scenario. Increasing variable renewable energy integration will require a flexible electricity system. Flexibility could come from fle facilitating flexibility, flex flexibility from consumer and removing barriers to greet flexibility by increasing storage and interconnection. Consumers that use EVs and, smart energy, and energy smart appliances could provide flexibility by shifting their demand. Malaysia is working on reforming markets to reward consumers for participating in demand response. Energy Pool, a European outfit that builds and operates demand-side management solutions, has been engaged by Malaysia's utility company, TNB, to identify the demand response potential in Malaysia and prepare the deployment of demand response operations. Smart technology will need to be deployed to send and manage price signals. Consumer and digital or smart energy systems in Malaysia is still in their infancy. Market-wide rollout of smart meters to domestic and small to non-domestic consumers is necessary to give consumers greater control over their energy consumption patterns. From 2020 to 2035, 36 billion ringgit has been allocated to modernize TNB's distribution and grid network. As of 2021, around 1.8 million meters have been installed in Klang Valley and Malacca, with a goal of 9 million installed by 2026. Energy smart appliances in Malaysia are mostly relegated to energy efficient devices, which were mostly standardized by 2022. Access to a wide range of interoperable and secure smart appliances will need to grow. There are relatively few of such devices that cater to a time-based tariff or can be integrated with smart meters to assist with demand side management today. In order to be part of a flexible system, EVs will require certain device level standards to fully integrate into the system as vehicles will require the capacity to feedback energy or at least have smart charging, charging capabilities included. Energy storage is vital when a high percentage of electricity is produced by variable renewables. The four technological approaches, approaches to energy storage systems are battery, thermal, mechanical and hydrogen. They are suitable for accommodating demand cycles of different time scales. The 100 megawatt batteries that will be installed annually into the Malaysian power system from 2030 to 34 are for grid stability, not for energy storage. Renewables plus storage should be mandated in Malaysia's energy transition roadmap. Before Malaysia has substantial transmission links to neighbouring countries, large-scale storage is needed if Malaysia wants to increase solar penetration in its power mix. Current interconnections between Malaysia and neighbouring countries are as shown. Increasing interconnection capacity between Malaysia and in neighbouring countries is a shared vision. Utility companies and energy authorities are studying these future interconnections. Southeast Asian countries need to develop clear and measurable standards to harmonise electricity planning and equipment and synchronise operation of pooled electricity systems. Transmission technologies with a higher voltage level are also necessary. Most of the cross-border transmission lines are 230 kV, 110 kV and below. 
Only few are at the 500 kV level, one between China and Myanmar, and six between Laos and Thailand. We look forward to a future where Malaysia can buy hydropower electricity not just from Laos, but from Sichuan, China. On this hopeful note, I'll hand, over, hand back to my chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much on a very interesting sharing uh, on Malaysia. Well, the bad news is that the coal is here to stay for a while, but we do receive good news too. If we are uh, really working hard, it is very likely to significantly decarbonize the power sector in Malaysia. So next, uh, we'll have Mr. Utam Gimiro. He's a water resource and ecological modeler from the Stockholm Environment Institute. He has been working in the sector of water, energy, food nexus and sustainable water resources management for seven years. A little bit background on uh, SEA as well, because all of us from the ASEAN Green Future are using the LEAP Energy Platform. The team received training from the Institute in March and April while online and May in person. So during a four-day workshop in Bangkok in May, country teams came together to collaboratively build a regional power sector model under the guidance of SEA. So we take this opportunity to thank Stockholm Environment Institute for that. Now uh, the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Uta. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Uttam Gimire, uh, already introduced by Mr. Chairman, a research associate from the Stockholm Environment Institute, Asia Center. So before I jump to the content of the presentation for today, I would like to give a small introduction about the SEI. We are an international not-for-profit uh, organization which is aiming to bridge the gaps between science, policy, and practice. Uh, we are actually located uh, across the globe at eight different locations. So we are in all continents except uh, Australia and Antarctica. Um, I personally come from the Bangkok Center, which is the southeast uh, and South Asia Center for the SEI. Uh, and I'm going to present some of the works that our colleagues and myself have been doing in the last few years pertaining to the net zero emissions in the power sector. So the first project that I would like to uh, give you an introduction is the Green Power Corridor Project. Uh, in the morning, the plenary session from uh, Dr. Jacks and other distinguished speakers, we already come to know that you know, a country might not be able to do a lot by itself. There is a need for a regional effort, right? So we actually had a similar kind of a modeling experience for the Northeast Asia, and it was called Green Power Corridor Project. So we did a leap modeling uh, to understand the regional power grid connectivity so that we can understand how the electricity supply can be made secure, affordable, and clean as well. Uh, for this, we also assessed the different dimensions of this power system integration. Uh, those were the technical, integra te technical dimension, economical dimension, and sustainability dimension as well. All the data that we fed were based on the latest reports that were available in each country. And we also did the modeling in a credible and transparent platform, which was open to all the member countries. Uh, so in this case, we had a combination of different scenarios. Uh, uh, Ms. Trang, she was explaining about the unconditional and the conditional NDCs. So those were also a part of the scenarios. So we had a sustainable scenario where two sub-scenarios were assumed. One was business as usual. You know, already countries have planned certain amount of NDCs. Also, they have their own plans of developing their own uh, power sector. Right. Also, there are sustainable development scenarios where we assumed that what if there is a conditional NDCs and there is a net zero targets and also there is a full attainment of the SDG 7 which is affordable and clean energy. Apart from that one, we since we are also planning to uh, model the different grids for the Northeast Asia, we had six different grids. 
The first one was the baseline, where we just modeled the currently existing lines between each country. The second uh, is nestled and bilateral transmission plants, Asian supergrid, Northeast Asian power system interconnection, Northeast Asian energy interconnection, and synthesis connectivity. So for the model itself, we divided the Northeast Asia region, the Russia, China, Mongolia, Republic of Korea, DPRK, and Japan into 18 power grids. And we simulated the model up to 2060. All the electricity demand, they were disaggregated by the sectors like transportation, residential, and so on. And the electricity generation was aggregated by technology like solar, wind, coal, and so on. Uh, also, the transmission network were uh, introduced by using one node per the region, and we had only the high uh, voltage connections that were modeled in the system. Uh, since we were talking about a regional model, we did not go into the intra-regional uh, connections and the transmissions. Now, let's look at this graph. On the leftmost side, we have a final electricity demand of the region which shows that if we are not going to do anything and we just follow the business as usual scenario, we come up with a gray graph, the gray graph, which is showing, of course, in future, we will be having increase in electricity demand, which is not a surprise to all. But a bit more confusing for you could be the sustainability uh, graph, like why it is increasing. It was because of different drivers, because uh, currently in Korea, uh, you know, there are a lot of places which are still unelectrified. And since we are talking about full electrification, climate change, and all those dynamics, we saw that the electricity demand will actually increase in the region if we are considering the sustainability or sustainability scenario. Um, I will not go into details of each of these connectivities based on the interest of time. Uh, but I would like to explain that each of these grids, they have their own uh, capacity. For example, the Asian supergrid, it has a big capacity, transmission capacity of 72 gigawatts. The Northeast in Asia Energy Initiative has almost 95 gigawatts. And the synthesis case has 42 gigawatts. Uh, this is just the illustration of what those grid look like, from where the power will come, where it, it will be connected, and so on. Um, so this is the result of electricity generation under the baseline scenario where everything is happening as per the business as usual. Uh, the black graph, the black part, is the amount of electricity that is generated by coal. And I think I heard some of the speakers, they were talking about you know, coal being the dominant source of electricity generation if we are to do nothing. And this is actually evident from our modeling work. Uh, of course, in future, we also see some amount of electricity that is generated by coal, uh, by wind, solar, and hydropower. And they will be coming in future, but still the coal will be the predominant one if we don't do anything. Uh, the usage of gas here is interesting. It is expected to be limited in future because of the high gas prices. Um, under the baseline sustainability, um, if we have a baseline sustainable scenario and we compare it with the different grids, we can see that if we add up to bigger grids, for example, the Asian supergrid, Northeast Asia Energy Initiative, there is going to be a lot of uh, reduction in usage of coal. You see all these black graphs over here, these are the coals, and they are expected to be replaced by the solar and wind. This is actually coming from the Gobitech initiative in Mongolia, and they will be the major supplier of electricity in the region. When we talk about the sustainable development scenario, uh, where you know, there is no connectivity, even though there is no connectivity at all, we see that the countries, they will still rely on coal, but it is going to get decarbonized eventually in the future. For example, by 2050, the coal, it is going to be replaced by uh, coal capture, uh, coal carbon and capture storage. And we also see you know, further renewable energy sources like wind and solar coming into action in the future as well. 
compared to the baseline scenario when you know there was no sustainable development uh, we look at this particular graph of electricity generation where sustainable development has already taken place and there are different grids we actually don't see a clear pattern among different grids here but we see an interesting spike in uses of coal to generate the electricity under one of the grids it was because of the immediate benefits that was coming from the existing coal power plants people didn't want to just change so it was actually coming from that one of course with the electricity generation and you know reliance on different kind of fuels we are going to have lot of greenhouse gases emissions so if we look at this graph which is the baseline uh, sustainability and connectivity uh, graph where we are doing everything business as usual we see a lot of the emissions in the future because we were depending a lot on coal and a lot of those emissions are actually coming from china um but if we look at this sustainable development one where we are looking at the decarbonization again you know there will be a drastic reduction in the greenhouse gases and again a lot of those reductions will come from china under different uh, grid connectivities the greenhouse gases emissions they will again be decreasing and again we can see the decrease in china under these big grids we can also see some increase uh, particularly in japan and republic of korea because they did not have any stringent climate change mitigation plans so they might actually still be using some other sources of you know electricity and they will be getting they will be having higher emissions but the other uh, countries in the region they will be having decrease in the greenhouse gases emission when you look at the sustainable uh, development scenario we actually don't see a lot of clarity in the future how the greenhouse gases emissions are going to reduce because we are already decarbonizing them in the uh, you know sustainable development scenario so even if if we can achieve that one already we might not see a lot of changes in the future as per the different grids but we still see that spike which was caused by the uses of coal of course if we are going to have uh the different grids we are going to have significant uh changes in the electricity production cost so over here we can see that the production cost of electricity it is going to go down in china under the baseline sustainability one if they if they are still in the baseline uh business as usual scenario if, but if they go to the different grids they are going to see a lot of decreases but in countries like mongolia uh, the electricity production cost it is going to be higher because they have to then go to the solar and wind and other things that they have to develop within their country so it will cost them some money under the sustainable development scenario again we see a lot of decrease in electricity production cost uh, in the other countries but we still see this particular graph over here which is the mongolia where they are inst installing the solar and wind so yeah we can still see over this one um with the sustainable development if we have the grids in place we can see that maybe in near future we might just be having one way uh, trade of electricity but as time passes by since trade is both way you will be having both way uh, exchange of power so that is expected in the region so the key takeaway is that we got from this project was the more connectivity we have it will be actually promoting the adoption of low cost renewable power also the transmission plants you know if we make them bigger and bigger we will see the benefits in terms of the greenhouse gases in terms of the electricity production cost and so on uh, the cost advantages of the improved connectivity they are increasing when net zero plans are taken into account uh, and since you know the uh, transmission lines they are both way uh, the both countries which are connecting and transmitting let's say power to each other they are going to get benefited also it provides an unique opportunity to invest money in certain countries for example mongolia where you know there might be some developments of the wind and solar 
Uh, so if you have further questions, I would uh, suggest you to reach out to our colleagues at US Center who were the in charge for this particular project. I can also answer some of the questions during our recession period if you have. Uh, but if you want to go into further details, which I might not be able to answer, uh, Jason is the guy to go to. Uh, apart from the Green Power Corridor project, we are also currently working on a Mekong Safeguards project where we are modeling the integrated resource and resilience planning practices in Thailand. So basically, we are just identifying low regrets power system planning strategies. And currently, this project is in place. So I don't have any results for you to show. Um, if you want to get further details on this project, I again urge you to reach out to our SEI US colleagues. Uh, in this case, the uh, focal point is Taylor. And the third one that I uh, had the privilege of attending was the Asian, supporting the Asian Green Future Project here with the UNSDSN uh, and also the member states of the ASEAN. So my colleagues here, they are already presenting on what works they were doing and uh, we also have some sessions in the afternoon. So I will not go into details of this one, what the results are. Uh, apart from that one, I uh, thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Utam, for such an exciting sharing on uh, what our Northeast Asia uh, counterparts uh, have been doing. Uh, now we shall move to a question and answer Q&A session. I'm sure um, you have many curious questions or many uh, additional uh, inquiries to make uh, to our fellow panelists. Uh, do raise your hand and our volunteers will be handling you Um, good morning, everyone. And um, my name is Abby. I work in environmental law. And it was a really interesting session because I've always been based in Europe for climate um, policies. So this is the first time I actually, I'm Malaysian, but this is the first time I actually heard and see in, in a very detailed of what sort of transition we're doing. However, there are a lot of disagreements. I respect that. But this question is for you. Uh, YB Lee Chen Chung, you're the member of parliament for PJ. To me. <laughs> no, but this is serious. We're all talking about political will. Yeah. And he has the key to actually change that. Why would you actually say coal is here to stay? No, that, that's based on the modeling. No, uh, but that is your modeling. opinion yeah. itself. Yeah, that's not my you, opinion. You said this is based on what Malaysian graph is and coal is here to stay. Why would you say that? No, and I'm, you're I'm, I'm supposed to be I'm an environmental to activist. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right, maybe um, let us uh, collect more questions before I address it as a moderator. And this is why we do not have political will on climate issues in Malaysia. And if we actually wonder why we're not moving forward, we have MPs like these. Um, okay, <laughs> now just to quickly address, uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm Look, responding to how many uh, people here the, in this room modeling. is from my generation. Mm. The generation that destroys the environment is not the generation that pays the price. Yeah. And if you keep saying that, I think I think she got my message. This is just uh, a young people's wrong, issue. Yeah. It is. <laughs> okay. All right, okay, let me address it first uh, before, before we pass the mics to others. Um, I'm merely responding to the modeling results. Uh, that's not my stand. That's not, not my uh, opinion. Uh, I am also part of projects that hope to decarbonize our country as soon as possible uh, based on the facts and data. And there are also a lot of ambitious projects that uh, we are kickstarting. We are also venturing into, like in the near term next week, we'll be uh, launching the energy transition roadmap. So perhaps we, we all can also take a look on how we can increase our renewable generation capacity to 70%. So this is uh, my short response. I shouldn't take much time from my uh, fellow panelists. Uh, maybe let us uh, get another, the second gentleman to uh, address your question. 
thank you. I think uh, Professor Leong just now you suggested the uh, introduction of solar power to Malaysia. I think one of the biggest hiccups is that when they go out for tender for who is to install solar power, everybody is like, throwing the price. You know, it's as low as 17 cents per unit. And then to the extent that these people who have the right to install this, they can't even get financing for that. Whereas if you know, when, when Fukushima happened, and let's take, for example, Germany, when they decided u u unilaterally to close their nuclear power plants, the government actually subsidized the transition. They actually helped to pay for the transition to wind and solar. Whereas when you go for this <laughs> breakneck tender and you bring down the price, it's so much lower. And then we come into this very awkward situation in Malaysia where we have whether we want to sell power to Singapore or not, the renew renewable power, because Singapore is buying at much higher prices from, 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 La from Laos. And here we are generating at 17 cents. So there's a very curious uh, situation where it doesn't help us. So we hope that the government will actually look at Malaysian interests first, because as you know, the Europeans are also already going to impose green electricity for our manufacturing. Most Malaysian manufacturers aren't able to comply with that. So I think, uh, I think that there were some statements by the minister that we need to start managing people's expectations that renewable is not cheap. The transition is going to cost and somebody has to pay for that. Right? And, and the other thing is for the low carbon, is there any nuclear option in all those, <laughs> in all those modeling? Thank you for um, highlighting the importance of reasonable costs. In procurement, often people want the least take the least cost approach, but that eventually uh, may not be in the best interest of the person who is procuring. It needs to be reasonable, reasonable because everyone who is involved in this supply chain needs to be sustainable, needs to survive, so that they can grow, they, they have profits and they can invest in, and, and they can improve and do better. And hence, you have an industry, the new industry can grow. And just wanting for the least cost is not the, uh, the, it's not the best approach. This is something that I think uh, procure, people who are in charge in procurement uh, needs. It's a shift of mindset. Quality of relationships, quality of the service provided actually is more important than least cost. That's question number one. Number two about nuclear. Nuclear is something that we have looked into with great interest since 2021. We think it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important option for Malaysia to look into. Because um, although it has the public perception of being dangerous, high risk, but uh, technology improves and Malaysians can learn how to handle this technology safely. A lot of things, things that are powerful are, are inherently dangerous, but we can learn how to handle it. So uh, it's not being mentioned here. Um, I think we, will, we, 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 we should explore that under a more, the more ambitious policy, build a scenario for that. We would like to do that. Yeah, back to you. Right, thank you. Uh, we have our third question. Hi, uh, my question is to the speaker from uh, SEI. Um, because I think because time was running very quickly, so you went through your slide very quickly. So can we go back to your slide 18? I'm very interested to find out uh, how did you, how did the, you arrive at this conclusion that the, uh, there will be uh, increased emission from ROK and Japan? Great. Can we get back to... Slide 18. Yep. Yeah. So as of now, you know, this is, if you look at this graph, this is the baseline sustain, sustainability, which is, we are saying that there is a business as usual scenario. The, uh, and the NDCs, they are unconditional, right? And we are comparing it with different other scenarios of grid powers. Like, okay, what if we have an Asian super grid? Or what if we have a Northeast Asian energy initiative grid? So when we are looking at those grids under one of the uh, initiatives, NEAEI, it shows that while all the other countries like China, uh, you know, China, Mongolia, they are actually seeing some decrease in greenhouse gases emission. Uh, we are seeing ROK and Japan, it has some increased emissions, right? So it was because of they are increasing the usage of fossil power. You know, since 
there was no uh, tying indices to them that, okay, we are going to follow this particular approach in reducing the uh, carbon emissions in Japan and Korea, they are still having some emissions. But for the other countries, it is decreasing. Right. Um, but I, I see that your timeline is 2030. Mm -hmm. So now we know that uh, most of the country NDC is up to 2030, right? So you are saying you are, you are envisioning that there will be an absence of a... You know, you base it on the assumption that there will be no stringent climate change yes. mitigation targets yes. after 2030 from these two countries. Yes. That's what the assumption is, right? That's why we have like multiple assumptions. And we, we have to assume that, okay, whatever is existing as of now, this is a baseline as usual scenario, mm. which is already saying that whatever is happening now mm. keeps on happening. So... Yeah, but it's, it's a bit strange to assume that these two countries, I mean, Japan is uh, NX1. I mean, we still, if you look at NX1 and non-NX1, and how can they have no amb ambition after that, after 2030? So if you... Uh, I'm just curious, how do you arrive to the conclusion that there will be an absence of mitigation action from, this group, from these two countries? I'm not saying that there will be absence of mitigation actions. I'm just saying that compared to the other countries, uh, the export of fossil power might still be there. If you look at the sustainable scenario, which was already conditional NDCs, or when the countries, they are uh, already willing to like decarbonize themselves, not use the fossil power, then you, you don't see uh, like, you know, increases in the greenhouse gases emission for those countries as well. So it's, it's actually based on the emissions, uh, the assumptions that you are making. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm sure we might have more questions. Uh, however, due to interest of time, uh, we have to quickly conclude uh, this session. So let's just also uh, give our fellow panelists uh, opportunities to make some concluding remark. Maybe um, start from um, Ms. Chuang. Um, yes, yeah, so as my um, presentation has highlighted, there are so, much, uh, so many opportunities for South Asia uh, to increase collaboration together. And this ASEAN Green Future is actually one form of collaboration where we share knowledge and share capacity. And it's not just at think tanks um, policy level, but at government level, there's so much strong, strong case for ASEAN countries, South Asia countries to come together to attract investment at scale and to work together on a shared renewable energy targets or whether it comes on to raise higher ambition in the region and to bring it to further accelerated actions. Thank you. Uh, Professor Prophet? Uh, I don't have much thing to say, but I hope that uh, um, Malaysian investors will go come to investing in hydropower sector in Laos and uh, send back electricity to Malaysia in the near future. Thank you. Okay, Professor Leong Yun Yong. Yeah, just now, um, actually, the Malaysian team's analysis shows that with existing policies that have already been announced, uh, Malaysia will still have substantial uh, coal generation by 2050. Hence, since we see that in our current, in, with the existing policy, that shows that we need to do more, which is the more ambitious policy, uh, more, the more ambitious policy. So, uh, uh, Chen Chung, he is actually an active member of uh, the ASEAN Green Future Malaysian team. Besides being a, serving his constituencies and being a member of parliament, he is doing a PhD in, in this area, actually wanting to decarbonize the power system uh, in Malaysia. Um, all right, I think, I think that's the okay. clarification that uh, I wish to make. Yeah, probably that clarifies why I'm here. <laughs> uh, Mr. Wutam, uh, yeah. your last of the last. Yeah, so for me, I would just like to borrow some lines from uh, the distinguished guests from the morning. Um, you know, even from our modeling results, we have been always getting the same answer. Uh, the more regional cooperation you have, the better chances you have to mitigate the greenhouse gases, to get lower cost for the electricity, uh, and to decarbonize the sector. So, you know, we, we need to act together. And maybe it's just, if it is just one country trying to do all things by itself, it might be too hard, too expensive. So I think regional cooperation is the key. Thank you. 
Right. Regional cooperation is the key. Thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, let's uh, put our hand together to um, thank our fellow panelists. Thank you very much.